three, two, one. Greetings. Welcome to Journey Through the Bible. Today we are concluding the book of Revelation, the last four chapters, 19, 20, 21, and 22. As we've said a dozen times, it's a complicated book written in great symbolism, but the message of salvation is the same. This is the book of the risen Christ. So let's bow our heads in prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son of the Holy Spirit, amen. Good and gracious God, once again, we give you thanks for this opportunity to delve into the sacred scriptures, recognizing your inspired word that guides us in our journey of faith. Help us as we come to the end of the New Testament, recognizing the message of salvation that Jesus has given us, the message of the risen Christ, the message of eternal life. In the name of the Father, the Son of the Holy Spirit, amen. All right, welcome everybody. We are at the conclusion of the book of Revelation, chapter 19. We recognize that this book has a lot of symbolism. Not all of it is to be read literally. There's a lot of symbolic gestures, a lot of numbers, a lot of symbols, but we do recognize that this was written for a group of people who had been persecuted in many different ways. They were persecuted primarily from the emperor of Rome who felt that he was a god. He was a deity. He should be worshiped. He should be referred to as Lord. Well, as we know, the Christians are against this, and as a result, many of them became martyrs, they were persecuted, and they suffered greatly. But this book is a message of hope, hope for all those who are suffering in the midst of persecution. So we're coming to the end of the book now, and this is chapter 19, verse 1. After this, I heard what sounded like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation, glory, and might belongs to our God for true and just are his judgments. This multitude is obviously the multitude of the angels. He has condemned the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her harlotry. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And obviously the harlot is a symbolism for the city of Rome, often referred to in the book of Revelation as Babylon. In verse three, they said a second time, Alleluia, the smoke will rise from her forever and ever. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sat on the throne saying, amen, alleluia. A voice came from the throne saying, praise our God and all you his servants and you will revere him small and great. Then I heard something like the sound of a great multitude or the sound of rushing water or mighty peals of thunder as they said, alleluia. Now we're very familiar with the term alleluia but alleluia basically is a word that just means praise God. Just as amen means I believe, alleluia is a word for praise God. When the children are preparing for their first Holy Communion, I tell them we will give them the consecrated host and say the body of Christ. They are to respond amen, and amen means I believe. So still in verse six, then I heard something like the sound of a great multitude or the sound of rushing water or mighty pearls of thunder as they said, Alleluia, the Lord has established his reign, our God, the Almighty. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding day of the Lamb has come. His bride has made herself ready. She was allowed to wear a bright, clean linen garment. Then in parentheses, the linen garment represents the righteous deeds of the holy ones. And who is the bride of the Lamb? We are the church, the people of God. In verse 9, then the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who have been called to the wedding feast of the Lamb. And he said to me, these words are true. They come from God. I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said, do not. I'm a fellow servant of yours and of your brothers who bear witness to Jesus. Worship God. Witness to Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. If you recall in the Acts of the Apostles, St. Peter and some of the other apostles were calling upon God's power, the power of Jesus Christ to heal people. When that happened, they started to worship Peter and the apostles. And they said the same thing, do not worship me. I'm a fellow servant of yours and of your brothers who bear witness to Jesus. We look at the idea of the great multitude in heaven. And again, I'm making references to Father Darren Harrington's book, Revelation, the book of the risen Christ. He says, the great multitude in heaven consists more likely of angels than of the martyrs. And then he talks about their second song, 
stresses the definitive characters of Rome's defeat. Smoke will rise from her forever and ever. The city of Rome had not yet fallen at the time Revelation was written, but St. John revealed this message from God, knowing that it would happen. The final song in verse six through, for verses six through eight comes from the entire heavenly host. It first celebrates the establishment of God's kingdom and its fullness. Then it describes this event as a wedding feast of the lamb. The imagery is based on various Old Testament texts that we will get into when we get into the next section of Journey Through the Bible, which is the Old Testament. We recognize this interlude between the angel and St. John, and in John's confused attempt to worship the angel serves to highlight the difference between angels and humans, recognizing on the one hand and God and the risen Christ on the other hand. So we are like the angels. We are servants of God. We are messengers of God. We are called to walk in his light. Now, as Father Harrington points out, thus far, the book of Revelation has featured several series of end time events, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven scrolls. Now, as this book comes to a close, one more apocalyptic scenario portrays a definitive defeat of evil and the absolute triumph of God the Lamb and the faithful witnesses. This is what's going to happen in the last four chapters of the book of Revelation. The definitive defeat of evil and the absolute triumph of God, the Lamb who is Jesus, and the faithful witnesses who are us, the church. We're recognizing it's going to be the binding of Satan and his subsequent short-term release and the thousand-year reign of Christ and the righteous. The last apocalyptic scenario proceeds in seven steps or phases. The parousia, the end times, the first battle, the binding of Satan, the first resurrection, the final defeat of Satan in the last battle, the last judgment, and the new heaven and the new earth. That's basically what we're going to go through today. So continuing in verse, chapter 19, verse 11. Then I saw the heavens opened and there was a white horse its rider was called Faithful and True. He judges and wages war in righteousness. You've seen so many movies where the one who's come to rescue you comes on the white horse. It's exactly where this came from. And verse 12, his eyes were like a fiery flame. And on his head were many diadems, crowns. He had a name inscribed that no one knows except himself. He wore a cloak that had been dipped in blood. And his name was called the Word of God. Remember, at the beginning of John's gospel, he says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is the Word of God. So again, in verse 13, he wore a cloak that had been dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. The armies of heaven followed him, mounted on white horses, wearing clean white linen. Out of his mouth came a sharp sword to strike the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod, and he himself will tread out in the winepress, the wine of the fury and wrath of God, the Almighty. Remember, the winepress is symbolic of the fury and wrath of God. Verse 16, he has a name written on his cloak and on his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Hosts. We recognize that everything that's happening here is setting up for the final judgment day. Father Harrington says, accompanied by the armies of heaven who join him in this battle, the divine warrior, the risen Christ, acts as the Messiah of the scriptures by striking the nations with the sword coming from his mouth, by ruling them with an iron rod and treading the winepress of God's wrath. The name written on his cloak and thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, establishes the risen Christ as superior to any human ruler, even and especially the Roman ruler. And the battle that follows, he shows himself master of the beast and kings of the earth, as well as the false prophet. The Lord is master of everyone. No one can defeat him. Now, still in chapter 19, verse 17, then I saw an angel standing on the sun. He cried out in a loud voice to all the birds flying high overhead. Come here, gather for God's great feast to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of military officers, and the flesh of warriors, the flesh of horses and of their riders, and the flesh of all, free and slave, small and great. 
Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered to fight against the one riding the horse and against his army. The beast was caught and with it the false prophet who had performed in its sight the signs by which he led astray those who had accepted the mark of the beast and those who had worshipped its image. We talked about the mark of the beast last week. The message of 666 is the numeric uh, corresponding to the letters of the emperor Nero. Nero had died by the time that this was written and the emperor Domitian had taken over, but the mark of the beast was the one that the people had accepted. The two were thrown alive into the fiery pool, burning with sulfur. The rest were killed by the sword that came out of the mouth of the one riding the horse and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. It's a very vivid description of what's going to happen at the last, uh, the last judgment. What we recognize is that in these seven phases, there are the different phases of what's going to happen at the last judgment. Remember the initial phase consisted of the appearance or the presence, the parousia, the end times of the risen Christ. The second phase that we just talked about is the battle. And the battle, the angel summons the birds of prey, such as the vultures, to prepare for God's great feast, a feast provided by God. The battle itself, which is interesting, is described in only two verses, still in chapter 19, verse 20 and 21. The entire battle is in those two verses. The beast was caught, and with it the false prophet, who had performed in its sight the signs by which he led astray those who had accepted the mark of the beast and those who had worshipped its image. The two were thrown alive into the fiery pool, burning with sulfur. The rest were killed by the sword that came out of the mouth of the one riding the horse. And all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. Now, the third phase is the binding of Satan, and this is the beginning of chapter 20, verse 1. Then I saw an angel come down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the abyss and a heavy chain. He seized the dragon, the ancient serpent, which is the devil or Satan, and tied it up for a thousand years and threw it into the abyss, which he locked over it and sealed, so that it could no longer lead the nations astray until the thousand years are completed. After this, it is to be released for a short time. This third phase of the binding of Satan, who is the power behind the beast and the false prophets in the unholy trinity. The abyss to which Satan is consigned is a temporary holding place, not his final destination. And the idea of the thousand years is symbolic. A lot of people saw that the new millennium in the year 2000, that was the end of the thousand years or the beginning, depending on how you look at it. Remember, everybody was concerned about their computers because the programming in the early part of the 20th century was limited to 64 characters. So rather than write out 1962, they would just put 62, knowing that that would be evident to the computer. The risk was what happens in the year 2001 and when you put something in there is zero one, well, obviously nothing happened, but everybody worried about it nonetheless. Well, that's what we're looking at here. This thousand years, this is a symbolic time. Now, the, again, Father Harrington's book, the abyss to which Satan is consigned is a temporary holding place, not his final destination. The heavy chain is to keep Satan bound up. The dragon has been previously identified as the ancient serpent, the devil, and Satan. His binding is to last for a thousand years. During this time, Satan will not be able to lead the nations astray. After the thousand years, God will allow Satan to be set free for a short time until his ultimate punishment. Now, it's interesting. We look at this idea that we have a thousand years symbolically of no temptation. Well, I don't think that has happened yet because we've certainly had throughout history many temptations. What we do know is that Jesus has the power over Satan. He is the one who has cast it through the angel Michael cast him out of heaven, and is not able to return. Still in chapter 20, verse 4, this is the fourth phase. Then I saw thrones. Those who sat on them were entrusted with judgment. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, and who had not worshipped the beast or its image, nor had accepted its mark on the foreheads or hands. 
Now, what's interesting here is today we're celebrating the Feast of Saints Peter and Paul at Mass this morning. We prayed for both of them, and we know that both of them were martyred. St. Peter was crucified upside down because he did not want to die the way that Jesus did. St. Paul was actually beheaded. And I'm pointing this out, for it says, I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, and who had not worshipped the beast or its image, nor had accepted its mark on their foreheads or hands. They came to life, and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were over. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over these. They will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for the thousand years. And once again, the thousand years is a symbolic term, but it's the idea of a long period of time. Now, as Father Harrington says, the fourth phase is the first resurrection the restoration to life of those who had remained faithful, even to the point of death. These are described with terms already used for the martyrs, and their reward is the first resurrection, which lasts for a thousand years and precedes the general resurrection. So that's referred to later on as the second resurrection. Thus, the victorious martyrs share in the Satan-free millennial reign of the risen Christ. Over the second death, over them, the second death, Eternal punishment after physical death has no power. Once again, even though you have a physical death, there is a second death that does not have power over them because they have received the message of resurrection. Rather, as they serve as priests of God in Christ, devoting themselves to the worship of God. Now we're going to have the fifth phase, and this is in chapter 20, verse 7. This is a definitive defeat of Satan. I know this is a lot, part of the lot of the book of Revelation that everybody waits for. Well, thank you for your patience. We have finally arrived. Chapter 20, verse 7. When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison. He will go out to deceive the nations at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. When we get into the Old Testament, we'll get into Gog and Magog. Those are, again, the ones who are against God, turning the people to their earthly desires rather than the heavenly kingdom. And verse 9, they invaded the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the holy ones and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. I love this in verse 10. The devil who had led them astray was thrown into the pool of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. There they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And as Father Harrington points out, this, the fifth phase, is a definitive defeat of Satan. After his release from bondage, Satan is to be active again for a short time. He will gather nations from all over the world, symbolized as Gog and Magog, and that's out of the book of the prophet Ezekiel. I said, we'll get into that in the Old Testament. So Gog and Magog are gathered together for one last attack upon the camp of the Holy Ones and the beloved city. Now, as Father Harrington points out, this is not much of a battle. Rather, it is simply a matter of fire coming down from heaven and destroying these armies. Now, Satan's power is broken completely, and he is consigned to suffer eternal punishment with the other members of the unholy trinity, the beast and the false prophet. Now, I know we've got a lot of terminology going on here and trying to keep track of who's who. It was the unholy trinity of Satan, the beast, and the false prophet. Now, Satan has been defeated. The sixth phase, this is the last judgment. We're still in chapter 20, verse 11. Next, I saw a large white throne, and the one who was sitting on it, the earth and the sky, fled from his presence and there was no place for them. I saw the dead, the great and the lowly, standing before the throne, and scrolls were opened. Then another scroll was opened, the book of life. Once again, the book of life is the book in which we recognize the names of all those who are to enter into the heavenly kingdom. The dead were judged according to their deeds by what was written in the scrolls. The sea gave up its dead, 
then death, and Hades gave up their dead. Hades was a term for the afterlife where you went where you were not a good person. We refer to that as hell or the eternal punishment. It was referred to in the Old Testament as Hades. So again, in verse 13, the sea gave up its dead. Then death and Hades gave up their dead. All the dead were judged according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the pool of fire. The pool of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the pool of fire. This pool of fire is a second death, meaning that your body dies. We have an earthly death, the first one, but then the second death is for those who followed evil, followed the devil, and not the will of God. Now, the sixth phase, this concerns the last judgment of all those who have died, apart from the martyrs who have already enjoyed the first resurrection. We recognize a new heaven and a new earth. All the dead are restored to some kind of life and are judged according to their deeds, which is written in the book of life. The personification of death and of the abode of the dead, Hades, not giving up their dead, not only giving up their dead, but also consigned to the pool of fire with Satan, the beast, and the false prophet. Again, the unholy trinity. They are joined by those whose names were absent from the book of life. This pool of fire. The basis of the traditional concept of hell is equated with the second death, which consists in separation from God and an eternal punishment. Now, I know this is a little confusing. We've got the first death where our earthly bodies die. Then for those who have not followed the will of God, those who have followed the sense of evil and Satan will have a second death, which consists in separation from God and an eternal punishment. Now, Father Harrington raises a question here that I think is very interesting. The last judgment involves the punishment of the enemies of God and God's people. How do we reconcile this with the mercy of God? Can both justice and mercy be attributes of God? I believe that they are because God is all merciful. He is going to judge us with justice. But we recognize the mercy of God. All we have to do is turn towards the Lord. Ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. Now, still in chapter 21, or beginning chapter 21, excuse me, verse 1. This is a passage that we hear at funerals quite often. And I think it gives great peace to families of those who have lost a loved one. And it's a message for each one of us who follow the will of God. And this is chapter 21, verse 1. John is speaking. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The former heaven and the former earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, God's dwelling is with the human race. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will always be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death or mourning, wailing or pain, for the old order has passed away. We look at this idea that how God is with us. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will always be with them as their God. Going back to the beginning of the Bible that will start next in the book of Genesis, we hear of the covenant that God made with Abraham, and it's the exact same message here. We will be his people, and God himself will always be with us as our God. And then in verse 4, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or mourning, wailing or pain, for the old order has passed away. The second death, which goes for those who are evil, we will not suffer a second death. The old order has passed away. And in verse 5, the one who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And then he said, Write these words down, for they are trustworthy and true. He said to me, They are accomplished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. This is from the Greek alphabet. The first letter, equivalent of A, is Alpha. The last letter is omega. So when he says, I am the alpha and the omega, I am the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give a gift from the spring of life-giving water. The victor will inherit these gifts, and I shall be his God, and he will be my son. 
But as for cowards, the unfaithful, the depraved, murderers, the unchaste, sorcerers, idol worshipers, and deceivers of every sort, their lot is in the burning pool of fire and sulfur, which is the second death. I know this sounds like he's repeating it, but he's just summarizing it, if you will, saying this is the second death. This is the end for those who choose evil rather than light. So as Father Harrington points out in his book, the seventh and final phase brings a new heaven and a new earth. The old earth and sky has fled from God's presence. The new heaven and new earth replace them. Moreover, the new Jerusalem descends from heaven to replace the old one as a special dwelling place of God. For the earlier bridal imagery applied to the church, for the wedding day of the Lamb has come to his bride, and come, and his bride has made herself ready. We recognize that all suffering and death will be banished, since there will be no more Satan and no more sin. The image of God wiping away tears is based on Isaiah 25. The Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces. Now, final Her Father Harrington points out something here that I think is interesting. The final scene is supplemented with three sayings from God. The first saying, behold, I make all things new, gives first person expression to what has already been described. The second saying is directed to John and confirms his vision as trustworthy and true. The third say saying is more elaborate. It first re uh, ref refer uses the terms Alpha and the Omega, appeared at the beginning of the book in chapter one. Then it promises to the victor the gifts described and a share in the father-son relationship enjoyed by Jesus the Messiah. However, the lot of the wicked, according to chapter 21, is to be with Satan, the beast and the false prophet, and the burning pool of fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Once again, we have an opportunity. We're all gonna receive the first death, do we receive the second death or do we move into eternal life and the new Jerusalem? The final and climactic scene takes its starting point where Jesus says, or excuse me, and John says, I saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Then he says, we are brought inside the city to see the light and life that reflect the splendor of God and of the Lamb. So in chapter 21, beginning with, starting with verse 9, we are going to hear about the new Jerusalem. Chapter 21, verse 9. One of the seven angels who held the seven bowls, filled with the seven last plagues, came and said to me, come here. I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. He took me in spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. It gleamed with the splendor of God. Its radiance was like that of a precious stone, a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a massive high wall with 12 gates where 12 angels were stationed and on which names were inscribed, the names of the 12 tribes of the Israelites. There were three gates facing east, three north, three south, and three west. The wall of the city had 12 courses of stones as its foundation on which were inscribed the 12 names of the 12 apostles and the Lamb. Notice we've got the number 12, symbolic here for the 12 tribes of Israel, symbolic of the 12 apostles. So in verse 15, the one who spoke to me held a gold measuring rod to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. The city was square its length the same as also its width. He measured the city with a rod and found it 1,500 miles in length, width, and height. Now, this is obviously not to be taken literally, 1,500 miles. I know when I go back to Memphis, Tennessee to see my family, I get 1,600 miles on frequent flyer. So it's just about here to Memphis, Tennessee. What we're talking, he's looking at here is all, something like shaped like a cube. And he measured the city with the rod and found it 1,500 miles, length, width, and height. He also measured its wall, 140 cubits, according to the standard unit of measurement the angel used. 
Now, when we get into the Old Testament, we'll talk about the idea of a cubit, because this is how Noah measured the wood for the ark. God told him exactly how many cubits it should be. How big is a cubit? It is from your elbow to the tip of your little finger. Why is that significant? Because they didn't have measuring tapes or, uh, or uh, yardsticks, sticks. So they'd measure that one, two, three. That's how they would measure the cubits. And that's exactly how he's measuring it here. So in verse 17, he also measured its wall, 144 cubits, according to the standard unit of measurement, the angel used. And where does the 144 come from? 12 times of Israel times the 12 apostles. In verse 18, the wall was constructed of jasper, while the city was pure gold, clear as glass. The foundation of the city wall, the foundations of the city wall, were decorated with every precious stone. The first course of stones was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysosolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysopapas, the eleventh hyacinth, and the twelve amethyst. Now, I know I mispronounced a couple of those. I did very well with Topaz because there's a street in Redondo Beach that's close to the bike trail. And sometimes I park my car on Topaz and then ride my bike down to the beach. And that's how I can find my car. Just remember the jewel of Topaz. But each one of them had a special jewel. Verse 21, the 12 gates with 12 pearls, each of the gates made from a single pearl. And the street of the city was of pure gold transparent as glass. Once again, we've got this great imagery here that John is writing about based, based on the vision that he had. Now, the new Jerusalem is the bride and the wife of the lamb. The holy city has its origin with God coming down from heaven. And it shares the glory of God and the new Jerusalem combines the motifs of the restored post-exile Jerusalem. And this is from Zechariah, Hagar, and Isaiah. And again, we'll get into all those in the Old Testament. The theme of the New Jerusalem is developed at even greater length in Ezekiel and in the New Jerusalem text and the Temple Scroll among the Dead Sea Scrolls. Father Harrington was one of the experts on the Dead Sea Scrolls before he passed away. He's written a number of books on them. The Dead Sea Scrolls are the oldest texts of the Bible that we've ever found. They were found in an area called Qumran, which was in Israel, very close to the Dead Sea. They were found in the 1940s. A young boy had a goat. The goat had gone into one of the caves. He went into the cave, found a huge jar, wrapped, sealed incredibly tight, opened it up, and there were scrolls. These are the oldest copies of the Bible that we have. Do the Dead Sea Scrolls still exist? Yes, they do. They're in Jerusalem in the Museum of the Book. I've talked about this before, but they have them laid out on plexiglass or uh, yeah, ple oh, fire bulletproof glass. And then the scrolls are laid out. And then another piece of bulletproof glass is put on the top. Then they do a process called hermetically sealing where they suck all the air out of it to preserve them. Do the Dead Sea Scrolls ever travel out of Jerusalem? Small pieces of them do. A few years ago, they were at the art museum, uh, the kind of, excuse me, the Museum of Science in uh, downtown Los Angeles near USC by the Coliseum. And we were able to go over there and see some of the Dead Sea Scrolls. But again, the majority of them are still in Jerusalem. Now, going back to the text here, Father Dan Harrington's book. The 12 foundation stones bear the names of the 12 apostles who themselves represent the 12 tribes of Israel. The angel, as in Ezekiel, sets out to measure the new Jerusalem and its wall and gates. The city forms an enormous cube, about 1,500 miles in length, width, and height. The wall around the city is about 220 feet high, a huge wall, but surely not for a city that is 1,500 miles high. And again, we've got to remember that this was in great symbolism that this is written. It would be nice if St. John had written a whole list of footnotes or a commentary and said, well, this is what this means, but that's why we study this text that's why we rely on scripture scholars like Father Dan Harrington, Dr. Scott Hahn. It's a very blessed time for us to be able to study these, even though not everything is totally clear to us. The material out of which the wall is made is precious jasper. 
and the city itself is translucent gold, both intended to highlight the city's splendor. The list of the precious stones that decorate the foundation stones is based on the gems that decorated the high priest's breastplate according to Exodus. Each of the 12 gates is made of a huge pearl and the street is translucent gold. So once again, we have many references to the Old Testament. We look at what's happening in Exodus 28. We'll get all into all that when we begin our study of the Old Testament. So now St. John is going to tell us what's going on inside the New Jerusalem. And this is chapter 21, verse 22. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. The city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gave it light, and its lamp was the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and to it the kings of the earth will bring their treasure. During the day, its gates will never be shut, and there will be no night there. The treasure and wealth of the nations will be brought there, but nothing unclean will enter it, nor anyone who does abominable things or tells lies. He closes chapter 21 by saying, only those will, only those will enter whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Once again, those who have followed the light rather than the darkness. All right, we are now ready for the last chapter of the book of Revelation, chapter 22, the last book of the Bible, the last chapter of the last book of the Bible. Then the angel showed me the river of life-giving water, sparkling like crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the street. On either side of the river grew the tree of life that produces fruit 12 times a year. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me start that again. On either side of the tree, uh, on either side of the river grew the tree of life. Now remember the book of Genesis in the Garden of Eden, there's one tree of life. In the book of Revelation, there are two of them, one on either side of the river. On either side of the river grew the tree of life that produces fruit 12 times a year, once each month. The leaves of the trees serve as medicine for the nations. Nothing accursed will be found there anymore. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will look upon his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Night will be no more, nor will they need light from lamp or sun, for the Lord God shall give them light and they shall reign forever and ever. Now it's interesting, Father Harrington points out that the new Jerusalem does not need a temple because God and the lamb are there. It needs no light because God's glory gives its light and the lamb is its light. All the nations will see its light and come to it, and its gates will never be shut. It will be the destination of the wealth of nations, and it contrasts with Babylon or Rome, which was full of abominations. In contrast, nothing unclean, and no one who is abominable, abominable will enter it. Now, the New Jerusalem has a river of life-giving water. We recognize the symbolism of baptism. Here there are two trees of life, where Genesis has only one. The, true, the two trees on each side of the river produce fresh fruit every month, and their leaves serve as medicine. Life within the New Jerusalem is devoted to the perpetual worship of God. Nothing accursed can exist alongside the throne of God and the Lamb. God's servants will look upon God's face, and God's name will be on their foreheads. Look at the idea of being on their foreheads. Many of our Jewish brothers and sisters, particularly in the Orthodox tradition, have a little black box called a phylactery that has some straps that go around their head. It's a reminder that the scripture should always be on their mind. This is the reference to the having the, the word of God on their foreheads. The light will be supplied by the Lord God, and they will share the reign of God and the Lamb. It's very interesting. Because what Daniel, Father Daniel Harrington points out, this is a picture of eternal happiness with God, and that's what we are seeking. Now, in the closing, there are the 10 sayings revolve around three themes. The authenticity of the prophet's message, the imminence of the Lord's coming, and exhortations to the readers and listeners to remain faithful. 
So in chapter 22, verse 6, and he said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of prophetic spirits, sent his angel to show his servants what must happen soon. Behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the prophetic message of this book. Now in verse 8, John is very specific when he says, It is I, John, who heard and saw these things. When I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, don't. I'm a fellow servant of yours and of your brothers and the prophets and of those who keep the message of this book. Worship God. Once again, it's the idea of we only worship God and not to have any false gods. Even if somebody like an angel does something very good for us, even if St. Peter, through the power of Christ, heals somebody, we are called not to worship one another, but to worship God. And verse 10, then he said to me, do not seal up the prophetic words of this book, for the appointed time is near. Let the wicked still act wickedly, and the filthy still be filthy. The righteous must still do right, and the holy still be holy. Verse 12, behold, I am coming soon. I bring with me the recompense. I will give to each according to his deeds. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And verse 14, blessed are they who wash their robes so as to have the right to the tree of life and enter the city through its gates. Outside are the dogs, the sorcerers, the unchaste, the murderers, the idol worshipers, and all who love and practice deceit. In verse 16, I, Jesus, sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and offspring of David, the bright morning star. It's interesting, when I was pastor at Holy Name of Jesus in South Los Angeles, they had the uh, big gospel choir. It was called the Morning Star Choir because it's taken right out of here in this verse 16 out of the book of Revelation. And verse 17, the spirit and the bride say, come. Let the hearer say, come. Let the one who thirsts come forward and the one who wants it receive the gift of life-giving water. I warn everyone who hears the prophetic words in this book if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words in this prophetic book, God will take away his share in the tree of life and the holy city described in this book. The one who gives testimony says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. It's very interesting. We see how he has this. Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Father Harrington concludes his book by talking about the 10 sayings that, we're just, that we just had here. The first saying comes from the risen Christ, saying the words are trustworthy and true. The second saying comes that we should worship God. The third, warn, the third saying warns against sealing up and making inaccessible this prophetic book. The fourth, the fourth saying is also from the risen Christ. It represents the prophet that is to come soon, who will bring rewards and punishments, each according to his deeds. He will also take to himself the titles that earlier are attributed to God, the Alpha and the Omega. The fifth saying is a beatitude that contrasts the faithful witnesses who can enter the new Jerusalem and the evildoers who must remain outside. In the sixth saying, the risen Christ declares again that he stands behind the book. He then proclaims himself to be the root and offspring of David, as well as the bright morning star. The seventh saying has the spirit, the spirit of Christ, and the bride, the church, issue an invitation to receive the life-giving waters. The A saying is a warning against adding or subtracting from words contained in John's revelation. Such a one cannot expect to enter the new Jerusalem. The ninth saying is another promise from the risen Christ that he is coming soon. And the tenth saying, the last one, is a response to the risen Christ that expresses the hope that he will indeed come soon. It echoes an Aramaic prayer, Maranatha, Lord, come which is found at the end of 1 Corinthians. Now, Aramaic is not Arabic. Aramaic is a language that is a variation of Hebrew, 
Jesus spoke Aramaic. We also know that he read and spoke Hebrew because he read the scrolls and the prophet of the prophet Isaiah in the synagogue in Nazareth. So this Aramaic word, Maranatha, Lord come, is a base of one of the oldest Christian prayers. And the book ends with a benediction that suggests that the book is to be read publicly in, publicly in church services. What's interesting, at Mass, we only hear the book of Revelation a couple times during Mass. It only takes place a couple times during the year. And I think a lot of that is because of the great symbolism and the great difficulty it is to understand. But I want to thank all of you for spending these six weeks with us on the book of Revelation, because we recognize that this is very difficult reading. It is great symbolism, but the message of salvation is the same. And so I'm going to read the end of this again. Verse 20, the one who gives this testimony says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Now, when we talked about this at the beginning, when we were going through the book, starting the book of Revelation, we talked about how many people have used this as a way of trying to guess or estimate when the end times will be. We talked about David Koresh, the Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas, the tragedy that happened there. There was also a guy who wrote a book called The Late Great Planet Earth. His name was Hal Lindsey. Hal Lindsey wrote this book, I think, in around 1970, with the idea that he was able to take the book of Revelation and historical events of the 20th century, match up everything, and he predicted that the world would end in 1982. Now, when I was a CPA with Price Waterhouse, we had a film client, a company called American Cinema Group that was originally based here in Torrance, right across from Barnes and Noble and that big bank building. They ended up moving down to Del Mar, but they were doing tax shelters where people would invest money at big write-offs, and they would make these movies. They made Go Tell the Spartans with Burt Lancaster. I'm sure you've all seen that. I, I've not seen it in a long time. They made the original Chuck Norris karate movies, Good Guys Wear Black, A Force of One, The Octagon. And those actually did very well because he was a well-known karate champion. But they also did a movie of the late great planet Earth. Years ago, I found it in a used rack on the DVD store. And last week I watched it. Now remember, this was based on a book written in 1970. The movie was made in the mid-1970s, mid probably 77 or 78. And in it, Hal Lindsey says specifically that everything in the book of Revelation is lined up so that the world will end in 1982. And he is warning everybody, look at how the planets are going to align. Look at everything with Russia and China. It's all fallen into place. 1982 is the year that we should be aware of. Well, as we know, 1982 came and went. Hal Lindsey rewrote his book saying that his calculations were wrong. I think he rewrote it a couple times before he passed away. But the thing that we need to keep in mind is we do not know the day nor the hour. Only the Father in heaven knows. The perfect purpose of reading this book of Revelation and spending six weeks on it is because it is the book of the risen Christ. And it is Christ overcoming Satan, overcoming evil, overcoming the darkness that is the essence of what our faith calls us to. So again, I know this has been a long six weeks of going through the book of Revelation. I want to say a special thank you to Father Daniel Harrington, who's now in the heavenly kingdom. I took a class from him in the fall of 1988. It was a class on New Testament and ethics. Probably one of the best professors <coughs> I've ever had and very clear in his speaking and in his presentation. Now, we have now come to the end of the book of Revelation and the end of the New Testament. We decided to do the New Testament first because of the richness of the Gospels, the Acts of the Apostles, the letters, and then the book of Revelation. But there was a lot that we read in the New Testament that actually has its source in the Old Testament, so many references. And I thought it would be helpful to go through the New Testament first, then next week when we begin the Old Testament, then we'll be able to see how things fall into place and how the things are fulfilled in the, in the message of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the outline that I did for the New Testament was actually 59 pages long. The outline for the Old Testament is about twice as long. So what I did is I broke it up into two sections. What I'm going to do over the next couple of days is I'm going to go through that and see if I need to make any changes. Then I will email it to Lauren. Lauren will then email it out to each of you. 
Hopefully each of one of you, have, or hopefully Lauren has each one of your um, uh, email addresses. If not, please call the parish office or send me an email. Get your pencil ready because I'm going to give you my email address. But the idea of going through the Old Testament, we want to go through that and see how the New Testament fulfills everything in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is not wiped away. It is fulfilled. All right. My email address, I'm going to say it and then I'm going to spell it. Father Paul Spellman at gmail.com. No hyphens, no periods, no abbreviations, no spaces. All right. Get your pen ready. F A T H E R P A U L S P E L L M A N at gmail.com. So as Paul Spellman, S P is in Peter. We've had a little confusion with that sometimes. Do not abbreviate anything because there's a Father Paul Spellman in England. Father Paul Spellman in England has gotten two or three emails from couples where I'm doing their wedding. I thought, why bother spelling out Father when we can just abbreviate it? Well, hopefully if they want to get married in England, Father Paul Spellman, I'm sure will be happy to handle their wedding preparation there. So again, we will be sending out the email on Monday with the attachment of the first part of the Old Testament, actually the first half of the Old Testament. When we go through the Old Testament, we're not going to go through it chapter by chapter, verse by verse, like we did with the New Testament. I did that with the Gospels because there's the great richness in the Gospels. The word gospel means good news. We stand for the gospel during Mass. Then the pandemic hit, and I thought, when is this going to end? Well, let's take the time to do it on Zoom, and we'll continue to do it just as we did. When we start the Old Testament, we're going to do a bit of a Beverly Hills bus tour through the Bible. We're not going to go through every verse and every chapter, but we're going to do an overview of the things that lead up to the birth of the Messiah. So again, we will continue to begin that next week. A lot of you have been asking, when are we going to be able to start meeting again in person? We are hoping to be meeting in person right after Labor Day in early September, and I will let you know on that. A number of other people have said, well, once you start meeting in person, what happens to those of us in Claremont and Los Angeles and Venice who are not members of St. Margaret Mary and watch this every week? Are we going to have to drive to Lomita every week? No, you won't. We will continue to do this by Zoom, and then we will do it in person with everybody gathered together uh, in one of the rooms here at the parish. All righty. It is right now 15 minutes before 11. And what happens at 11 o'clock every Tuesday? The gardeners come. They come with the lawnmowers, the weed eaters, the leaf blowers. We've had a couple of problems with that in the past, and we're going to make sure we don't have a problem with it today. So let's take a moment and bow our heads in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Good and gracious God, we've spent the last year and a half delving into the New Testament, recognizing that every word is inspired by the Holy Spirit, but written by human beings. We give thanks for this opportunity to begin our study in the Old Testament, recognizing the Hebrew scriptures with the scriptures that Jesus read as a child and as an adult. We give thanks for this opportunity to come before you, praying for an end to this pandemic. We have turned the corner with the vaccines. We are now back in our church and able to gather. We continue to pray for the healing and protection of everyone. And we close with a prayer for those in Florida who passed away in that horrible collapse of that condominium. There are nine, at this point, nine people confirmed dead. Unfortunately, there are over 150 who are still missing and accounted for, and it's been almost a week. So we continue to pray for them. We pray for their families who mourn their loss and those who are going through this great struggle, anxiety, and uncertainty. And loving God, I call upon your blessings on all of us here today, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.